It was on the ragged streets of New York's East Village where pioneering punk band Blondie first found their voice. New York is not the most beautiful place in the mid-1970s. Economically, things were really tough in the city, but artistically, there was some really exciting things going on. I don't think that I had uh, a clear picture of, you know, what I wanted to do by any stretch of the imagination. I never had a job. I, I mean, Debbie has had a couple of jobs through her life. She was a hairdresser and a Playboy buddy and bartender, but beyond that, it was just the band. I had a good, conservative, solid upbringing. I don't think that my family really wanted me to be an artist. I think they felt it was uh, dangerous and, you know, unknown to them. She's truly a bohemian who wanted to create, almost like a paint, this sort of vision of her dream band. And Blondie became this sort of shared dream of her and Chris Stein. Guitarist Chris Stein and Debbie Harry were playing with the girl group, the Stilettos, when they caught the attention of a young drummer, Clem Burke. And when I was about 18, I moved into Manhattan, lived in a storefront on the Lower East Side with a couple of friends, and uh, went to a place called the Club 82 a lot, which is where I met uh, Chris and Debbie. Initially, they were in a band called the Stilettos. I was really looking for someone that had the power and the charisma and the talent of a Mick Jagger or a Bob Dylan or a David Bowie. As the trio began putting the pieces together for a group, they went searching for a band name that would get attention. If a blonde woman is walking by, hey, Blondie! <laughs> you know, that was a kind of a chauvinist insult that you used to hear every day if you were out in the streets in New York City. It was interesting that they were able to appropriate that and that it worked. The group launched their career in the East Village at CBGB's, a club that embraced unconventional bands. CBGB's was both awful and awesome, as all great rock clubs should be. It wasn't a place that you particularly want to walk into in the middle of an afternoon. But as a hotbed, again, of creativity, it sort of was perfect. There were a bunch of people using it as a theater, using it as a it kind of like a musical 7-Eleven or something, except with, with, you know, place to get attention and maybe get discovered in New York City. We'd be there basically every night, and we had our equipment set up in the loft, and, you know, we'd all sit around in a circle, and someone would come in with an idea, and uh, we'd all kind of contribute our ideas and kind of work on it a bit and do it very organically. The Runaways played CBGB's, and it was quite a great, dirty little club, you know, perfect, covered in stickers and paint and booze and wall-to-wall -wall people. It was the perfect little trashy venue. I lived there in the early 90s, right on the Bowery, right across from CBGB's, and it was really pretty dirty and some would say dangerous then. So in the 70s, I, I can't even imagine. The stage at CBGB's and other clubs in the area were a breeding ground for a new back to the basics movement known as punk. Originally, it was sort of like an attitude and uh, then it sort of evolved into a particular style of music that was really uh, predominantly connected to the Ramones. It really took on their identity. We were coming out of this period where musicality and finesse were very important. And the whole punk movement and the whatever, new wave movement, whatever you want to call it, was very do-it-yourself. And it was very much about, you know, just bringing this passion to what you're doing and anybody being able to do it in, in a way. Punk is more of a mindset. Punk is more about flouting expectations and not doing what's expected of you. Punk is about operating and doing things and thinking things and not worrying about what other people think. I think it's sort of a social statement, perhaps an anti-social statement. It was also about being who you are. You know, all of a sudden, people who felt funny about expressing themselves, they liked to dress a little quirky or whatever, they now felt a little freer to express themselves in that way. Blondie's I don't give a shit attitude definitely was that. It was what inspired them. And I think the fact that it was a woman singing songs that were not typically feminine and, and gentle and, you know, sweet and caring, that was also kind of an I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. 
part of their band. As the newly formed band searched for their place in the punk scene, Debbie knew she had found an artistic soulmate in Chris Stein. They had this really interesting creative and romantic partnership that kind of created this very interesting tension within the band that I think led to some amazing music. He was so talkative, he was an intellectual, um, and she was just, she just loved that. When he spoke, she listened. And for somebody who exuded a lot of apathetic cool, that was really remarkable. Before she met Chris, I don't think she had any way to convey her strength. I think she played the female ingenue musically, you know, it was like this sort of folk thing or whatever. But I think he saw her strength artistically. What was really remarkable about the two of them, Chris Stein and Debbie Harry, is that they quickly, whew, quickly developed into seriously accomplished songwriters and vocalists. The other guys in Blondie, you know, Clem Burke is one of the best drummers who ever lived. But truthfully, to me, the magic of that band is what happened when the two of them got together. Before the punk-inspired hit, one way or another, became a classic, Blondie's gritty, in-your-face vibe was a tough sell to big labels. To find momentum, they headed to Los Angeles, where the band Blondie connected with a young Joan Jett and the Runaways. A lot of bands would stay at a, a hotel called the Tropicana, and Blondie used to come and stay. They wouldn't just come in and out of town. They would come and stay for a period of time. We met the Runaways early on in their career, but those guys got so much crap. They were being knocked because they were teenage and women. I was just a you know, 17, 18 year old girl who wanted to rock and didn't think much deeper than that. And I think she just got, got a kick out of that. And I really felt to a degree a mentor vibe from them because I could ask them questions about things that they had experience with that I hadn't yet. Even with a punk and new wave scene gaining ground on both coasts, for Blondie, there was no sign of breaking into the mainstream. There was a lot of resistance in America to what was happening in New York and L.A. in this new music scene. Initially, punk rock wasn't a big seller. In America at the time, disco was so pervasive, disco and classic rock. And Blondie at that time didn't fit into either of those categories, even remotely. The whole punk label really made people worried. In spite of the 60s having passed and it being the 70s, it was still a kind of conservative period. Like many artists before them, including Jimi Hendrix, Blondie left their home country behind and found their footing with fans by touring in the UK. Jimi Hendrix was essentially a New York artist that went to the UK and, and, and made its mark and then translated back to the US. And I think there is a, a pattern for success that where you can incorporate that of going elsewhere and then bringing it back. A lot of times England was really ahead of the curve in terms of musical trends or really embracing unique different things. The UK is much more accepting of new acts and I think that that is an incredible gift that the UK gives to artists because then you can go over, have, you know, six or seven number one songs and no one in America still would know your name. The Sex Pistols were sort of bubbling up there and kind of causing a revolution and so there was definitely, the country was primed more for new sounds, was really hungry for new sounds and I think Blondie really provided that. In September of 1977, Blondie signed their first major record deal with UK label Chrysalis Records. They returned home to record the ambitious Parallel Lines. The record's final single, One Way or Another, came together quickly with guitarist Nigel Harrison and Debbie driving the session. We organized a rehearsal. It was myself, Nigel Harrison, the bass player, and Frank Infante, the guitarist at the time. Nigel had this riff that he brought in and Debbie just spat out that phrase very quickly and then she developed the lyric around it. It's a phrase that existed. It's not like I made it up. Um, I just took it and I put it into a song. So I'm a dirty thief, you know? <laughs> that jam was recorded and Nigel brought, took that a step further and came up with an arrangement and that was the music to one way or another. A lot of the what made that song work is down to Clem Burke because there are these shifts, you know, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Do, 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 do,
tu 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 And then it's suddenly, da, half time, da, da, light. So it's, whoo, and that's really, really tricky to do and maintain the flow. If I think about myself listening to one way or another, I think about being in my living room and turning it up as absolutely loud as it goes and like throwing myself around the room and like banging my head and just like yelling all of the words. You think about how she looked kind of like Marilyn Monroe and she played off that imagery of the great American elusive blonde. But the music didn't do that. The music was in your face. It was mocking at times. The lights are all out. I'll follow your ass downtown. You can hear like her sort of sneering or growling in certain lyrics. I had never heard anybody sing like that before. You know, it's so genius. I looked up to Debbie because she was expressing herself in a way that was different than what I was doing, but I really respected it a lot because you could tell a lot of thought went into her writing and the way she presented herself. You take a song like One Way or Another, it's pure attitude. I actually was trying to create a character as well as putting some of myself in the character. And I was also in trying to embody the whole band. So there was, you know, this sort of male-female aspect of it, and it, it was very driven and a little bit demented, I suppose. <laughs> Feeding off the punk do-it-yourself movement brewing in the Bowery, Blondie was a band whose music and image oozed with New York attitude. That in-your-face spirit was on full display in the group's hit track, One Way or Another, where Debbie gets personal with the lyrics. She's a killer rock singer, and one way or another, the growl in that voice and when she goes really low in the timbre, that's a, that really emphasizes the power of that lyric, right? I'm gonna get you. It's a little semi-biographical about being stalked. I remember hearing One Way or Another for the first time and being like, this is a stalker song, but also it's kind of the best song in the world, and I was kind of like confused. Well, it was a good phrase. It just popped into my head. It relates partially to an experience I had with a stalker, but I think that the refrain is actually much more positive than that. It's deceptively simple. Um, Debbie wrote it apparently after an, uh, an ex-boyfriend was stalking her. And if you don't know the backstory at all, you can see it as a, wow, this is kind of a love song. This is someone being pursued by someone. And that's kind of genius. I think it's very positive to say, well, one way or another. She was hanging out with a lot of tough people. If you were in Blotty at that time, you're going to be running into uh, Iggy Pop. David Bowie and Mick Jagger are going to come over to your house and check you out. There's going to be all sorts of different hazings and en encounters. She knew that she had to rise to the challenge and toughen up, and that comes through in the lyrics. She is an outrageous beauty, but she's also a tough girl. The artists and bands that came to follow after us realized we kind of did it in a very do-it-yourself, for lack of a better analogy, punk rock attitude. You know, people weren't telling us what to do. We were telling people what to do. Can you get you? Can you get you? Uh, one way or another. 